The Word of God is a sure foundation that has stood the test of time. Sadly, millions have built their religion on the ever-shifting sands of human opinion. Jesus warned only those who anchor their faith on the unchanging rock of His Word will stand through the coming storm. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Well, friends, I'm very excited about this program, and uh, I solicit your prayers. We're going to be doing something unique before in, in the um, presentations. Uh, you know, before I go any further, I want to begin by thanking everybody who has been helping. Uh, 3ABN has been just doing an outstanding job. They've sent, oh, at least 12 or 13 of their team, and they, they've been working so hard, and I just want to thank them for the wonderful job. What, what a professional crew. Also, will you indulge me while I tell Mrs. Bachelor hello? She can't, she couldn't come. She's made being a mom a priority, and we still have the youngest of the Bachelor tribe is in school. Matter of fact, I can say hi to Stephen. He's up in Canada right now, and I'll, I'm just uh, silly enough to think he might even be watching his father. But um, just in case, hi, Stephen. So, uh, but I want to thank everybody for both Amazing Facts and 3ABN that has brought this together. Uh, this series is unique. It's something of a hybrid. Uh, not that it will get you better gas economy, but it is a, a combination of a revival, and I believe it has evangelistic potential. You see, I believe we're entering the last days, and we know that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he had one church, and he said, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. But right now, the Christian church is very fractioned and divided. And we know that there is going to be a polarizing movement in the last days. Everybody is going to be part of one, two, one of two primary groups. One group is, as we all know, going to worship the beast and its image and receive the mark of the beast. The other group will receive the seal of God and worship the Lord. That means something's going to happen between now and then so that people are going to uh, coalesce in these two groups. I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I have not always been. When I first became a Christian, I fellowship with another persuasion. I believe the greatest part of Christ's true followers don't happen to be members of my church, but I think that many of them will be before the end comes. I believe that this is a revival movement that is inviting people to return to the Bible, and we need to know that we're standing on the rock of God's Word because a storm is coming. So the focus of this meeting is really twofold. If you happen to be a member of the God's Remnant Church or Seventh-day Adventist, I hope that it will encourage you in our unique beliefs and that your roots will get down a little deeper and more firmly established. Uh, those Christians who may be watching from other persuasions and you're just wondering about all the confusion of doctrine, I pray that you'll listen with an open mind and an open Bible in your hands and see if what you hear makes sense. So that's really what we're talking about. We're nearing the end. This is an appeal for revival among God's people and among Christians anywhere to take a close look at what it is Seventh-day Adventists believe. We're going to go through some of the, we're going to highlight, quite honestly, some of the unique beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists, and uh, we would like you to consider those things. So um, we have a special message tonight, and we're starting with some of the basics. And the title of the message is Dilemma and Deliverance. We're going to be talking about uh, the priorities. I'd like to start at the very beginning. First of all, I think most of us will recognize we're going to be very basic. We're here. Take a deep breath. You're still alive. If you're not sure, pinch yourself. If you're not sure about the person next to you, don't pinch them. <laughs> but all right, let's start with the basics. We're alive. Something else we know is we're not alive for very long. I was listening just a couple of weeks ago and uh, the oldest woman in the world just had her birthday. Her name is Edna Parker. I think it was August 14th. She was 114 years of age, lives in Indiana. And uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm assuming she's still with us. But when you're 114, you know, 
you, people usually don't try and sell you life insurance. <laughs> Why am I saying that? We know we're here, but we're not here for long. Maybe three score and 10 is the average. If you live in Japan, it's a little higher. If you live in Nigeria, it's lower. And so we're not here for long. So we've got to ask a very important question. We know we're here. We know we're not here for long. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? I was consumed with this question as a young man. And I just searched through all the different religions and tried to figure out what the purpose of life was. You know, there's a, um, a book I saw. I was doing some research. And there's a book that you can buy for $449. It's actually a pair of two books. And it's called The World Christian Encyclopedia. It deals with all the different major religions of the world and their adherents, not just Christianity, and how many members they might have in their church. Notice this, for instance. Uh, there are 10,000 distinct religions in the world. 150 of those religions have more than a million adherents. Islam, for instance, has 1.5 billion. There is uh, one, I'm sorry, there's over a million from Islam, 1.5 billion agnostic or atheists. It's probably talking about former Soviet Union and China. 1.1 billion Hindus, 900 million Chinese Confucianism, 394 million Buddhists, 376 million from the indigenous tribal religions. There's about 500 million of them, 14 million Jews. Christianity is the largest group, 2.1 billion. Why is it the larger, largest group? Within that group of 2.1 billion, catch this, there are 33,830 denominations. And I think that's probably doubled in the last 15 years because so many churches are starting as community churches. They organize as their own denomination. They pay their tithe right into their local church. Congregationalism, 33,000. All their beliefs might be a little bit different. There is sort of the generic variety of Christianity. So what's the truth? How do you know? Where do you go? Well, after my life search, the early part of my life, studying all the different religions, and I came from a Jewish mother, father was raised Baptist, pretty much grew up agnostic or atheist. I was wide open. I just wanted to know what is the truth. And I came to the very firm conclusion that the Bible was true. It was unique and different from every other book and that it was the Word of God. But here's a problem. There are so many different interpretations for the Bible. So what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, try to evaluate 33,000 different denominations and try to find out, uh, you got a lot of time tonight? <laughs> Go through them one by one? No, you know, I understand that uh, those who are experts in studying, studying some of the uh, counterfeit real, um, currencies they don't specialize in studying counterfeits. What they do is they become so beautifully acquainted with the genuine currency that when they see a counterfeit, they recognize it right away. We're going to be looking at the genuine. We're going to be looking at what the Bible teachings are and especially accenting some of these foundational teachings that have been lost by Christianity. And tonight will be one of them. So we want to know what is truth? What is truth? You know, this was the question that Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, kind of cynical. What is truth? Can anyone know what truth is? People are like that now. They say, you know, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and everybody has their own truth. Is that how it works? What if a pilot was to take off from point A to point B, and uh, every pilot says, I'm just going to go whichever way the Spirit leads? I'm not going to follow a specific course heading. And as far as the laws of aviation are concerned, well, perhaps they've changed for me today. Anyone want to get on a plane with a pilot who thinks like that? Or are there certain absolute rules of flying regarding wind spree, speed and lift and fuel consumption? And those rules are definites that you need to use to calculate. They don't change. It's a truth. Just for fun. You know, this will be fun. Get an audience shot here for our, our uh, producers. I want to give them a little warning. All right, you ready? 
When I count to three, I want everybody here to point north. <laughs> One, two, three. Ha! Sorry. Ha! You're going every which way. Now, it seems to be if I was going to go with the audience majority, some of you probably got that built-in gyro. You're pointing kind of that way. I saw some of you pointing that way, and I saw some pointing that way, and some even pointed over their hands. So, when we leave, we're all just going to kind of go our own idea of north home? <laughs> or is there a true north? Yeah, there is. And we can use a GPS or we can use a compass and we can find out what that is. Well, our compass in discovering what truth is during this series is going to be the Bible. Amen? Now, if you don't believe the Bible, then you probably won't enjoy these meetings. But for those who believe that the Bible is the Word of God, it will make sense to you. And if you believe in Jesus, then you should believe the Bible because the Bible tells us that Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. The Word of God is the truth. And we can trust Him that if we follow Him, uh, if we become like Him, we're going to get there. So in the Word of God, a matter of fact, just to solidify that point about what is truth, in the Bible, Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is truth. It's that solid foundation that we need. And so uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to just believe that the Bible is going to be our foundation through this series, and we're going to base everything on this. You know, there is a way that seems right to a man, but what does it say? The end of that way is death. And a lot of people are sort of going their own idea of what truth is. There is an absolute truth. We need to know what that is. You know why? The Bible says the truth will set you free. Now, the title of the message is Dilemma and Deliverance. We all have a dilemma. Our dilemma is that we're dying, and we're dying because of sin. The penalty for sin is death. But there is a way out. Jesus is offering everlasting life. You, when you really think about it, of all the things that might be going on in Lansing, Michigan, all over the world, nothing is really more important than what we're talking about. We're talking about the purpose of life and how to live forever. And nothing is really more important than that. Now, uh, a foundation scripture for our series is going to be Psalm 11, verse 3. And it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Our foundations have been under attack. The foundational teachings of the Bible are under attack. Now think about this. When Jesus came the first time, did the church that he was part of have Bibles? Yeah. Did the Jewish people have scriptures? Yeah. Did they have prophecies? Were there prophecies that talked about Christ coming the first time? Were they ready? Were the majority, was the majority of the church ready for his first coming? They went to church, they had a lot of ritual, they had a lot of fellowship, they had a lot of rules, a lot of program, but they were off track on the truth. I understand that in the length of one railroad tie, if the two tracks are off one quarter of an inch, then after you go one mile, they're off 200 feet. Just getting off that little bit in that first length of track will send it way off as you go down the road. And what has happened to the Christian church today is the foundations have been attacked. Some of those foundational teachings are regarding to the Word of God and the law of God. We're going to be talking about that. Let me give you a quote, and this is from the book First Selected Messages 201. And I see this as an inspired commentary on what we're talking about tonight. As a people, we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth. That's why we're calling this, here we stand. That has withstood the test and trial. We are a hold to the sure pillars of our faith. The principles of truth that God has revealed to us are our only true foundation. They have made us what we are. The lapse of time has not lessened their value. It is the constant effort 
of the enemy to remove these truths from their setting and to put in their place spurious theories. That's what's been happening. Satan will bring in everything that he possibly can to carry out his deceptive designs, but the Lord will raise up men of keen perception who will give these truths their proper place in the plan of God. The truth has been under attack because it is the truth that sets us free, and the devil hates the truth. Jesus is the truth. The devil hates Jesus. Did that make sense? I always like to share amazing facts during our, uh, our meetings. You know, the race is on among the major cities and countries of the world for the tallest building. They're all kind of reaching a little higher up into the heavens to uh, scrape the sky, these skyscrapers. Of course, the Empire State Building was the first grand old lady that uh, reaches up over, what is it, 1,400 feet. And then it was the World Trade Center, Sears Tower, the Taipei 101 building, the building uh, in the capital of Malaysia, and right now on the drawing board of China, South Korea, Russia, they've all got super skyscrapers that, and they're all trying to trump one another for the tallest building in the world. Well, right now it appears that the, um, the people in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, that they're gonna be holding the prize for a while uh, they're building a building that is called Burj Dubai. This is a picture of it actually under construction. It, well, let me read some of the facts to you. Get it straight here. It's going to be, well, I'll tell you that later. You can see it right now from about 60 miles away, and it's not half done yet. They expect it will be done about 2009, 160 floors. 56 elevators with luxury apartments, corporate suites, swimming pools, the final height has been kept top secret, but inside estimates are it will top 2,600 feet, meaning that it will be approximately twice as tall as the Empire State Building. Oh, by the way, are you wondering why gas is so expensive? <laughs> this building is going to cost about a billion dollars. It seems like money was no object, and that's with very inexpensive labor. That's a lot of money. I always thought it was kind of interesting, though, as I read this amazing fact that uh, it's going to be about twice as tall as the Empire State Building, but the Empire State Building is built on the solid rock of Manhattan Island. They're building this on the sand of, of uh, Dubai. So you wonder. And you know, when I read my Bible, it makes me think about the first skyscraper. You know where you find that? Only a few hundred miles north of where they're building this one. You read in Genesis chapter 11, this is echoes of Babel. The Bible tells us there a man was trying to make a name for himself, and he's building this tower that was going to reach under the heavens to save himself. And God looked down, he wasn't very happy with what they were doing, and he confounded their project, and he confounded, he confused the languages of the world. You know, you wonder if, as we near the end of time, and man is moving one more time towards a one-world government and a one-world economy, trying to make a name for himself. If we're just seeing that what happened back at the beginning, that it's starting to repeat itself. History seems to be repeating itself except in reverse. Well, you know that Tower of Babel, it uh, disintegrated. And some historians tell us that for many centuries after the rubble of the Tower of Babel, it was still in the vicinity there by the Euphrates River. Years later, another great king came along by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he built the most beautiful city that's ever existed on earth. It was called the Golden Empire of Babylon during its heyday. And Nebuchadnezzar, in the middle of that city, he built the Temple of Marduk. And uh, the historian Herodotus says that he, he uh, well, for one thing, he talks about it. It was a virtual skyscraper, probably not as tall as Burj Dubai, but it was... Uh, it had a circular staircase and places to rest along the way and an altar at the top. And he used some of the rubble from the original Tower of Babel for the core of the Temple of Marduk. It was during this time of King Nebuchadnezzar, when he was uh, in the height of his power, that he conquered Jerusalem. 
and he led away captive to Jerusalem, or from Jerusalem to Babylon, a number of captives. He destroyed the temple. He brought them back. He tried to indoctrinate all of the captives and representatives from these different empires with the uh, teachings of Babylon. And one of the things he did that was sort of the, the pinnacle of this effort to create a one-world religion, you see, he was a king over many different nations, and he knew you can't really unite people based on language that's difficult and everyone's got their customs and people are very jealous for their soccer teams and their culture, but you can unite people based on religion. And people from many different cul cultures may have the same religion. And so he tried to sort of incorporate this one world religion and the way he planned on doing it, and you find this in the book of Daniel chapter 3, he built this great idol, 60 cubits high, six cubits wide, and one theologian I read says if they don't give you the depth, then you can assume it's the same as the width, meaning it was 60 by 6 by 6. Isn't that interesting? And he told everybody that they were to worship. Here it is from Daniel chapter 3, verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning and fiery furnace. Now, it just so happened that in the kingdom of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had in his kingdom and he had on his payroll three very dedicated, devoted employees, and they worshiped Jehovah. They worshiped the God of the Bible. And when this, they perhaps did not know what was happening, they came out of obligation to this inauguration, and when they heard the mandate that when the music played, they were supposed to bow down, they resolved within themselves that they would not bow down. And the king said, whoever didn't bow down, what was the penalty? Death. What would you do? Well, you see, it says in God's law, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, it's very plain. You shall not, not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. It was very clear. Now, I suppose the temptations for them were very numerous. Friends who were maybe standing around them, there were other Jews that must have been in the crowd that day, and they knew how devoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, and they were probably saying, what are you going to do? We've all heard the decree. Soon the curtain's going to drop and expose the image, and the music's going to play, and they probably had quite a band. Would have inspired you to want to just get involved in the worship. What are you going to do? They said, well, we're going to put God first. We're going to stand. Oh, you're out of your mind. You'll lose your job. If you obey, you'll lose your job. And they, they said, well, it's not optional. It's not something we can discuss. God commands it. They're not called the Ten Suggestions. They're not the Ten Good Ideas or the Ten Great Recommendations. Now, this is one of the truths that has been lost by Christianity is something as basic as the law of God. And it's something we need to understand because the way I read my Bible, this is very similar to Revelation 13 where it says another law is going to be made and whoever does not worship according to this beast power is going to be killed. And if you don't know where you stand and if you're not willing to stand for God's truth, His word, His law, then what are you going to do? in order to protect, protect your convenience or your comfort, or maybe what you'll do, I bet there were people in the crowd that said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and their Hebrew names were Hananiah, and Mishael, Azariah. Tell you what, when the music plays, don't, don't uh, pray to the image, but you should bow down and pray to Jehovah. You'll know in your heart who you're praying to, and that's all that really matters. I mean, God looks on... Man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. In your heart, you pray to Jehovah. I mean, then there'll be no problems. Think of how mad the king's going to be. You're going to ruin the whole celebration. When in Rome, do as the Romans. When in Babylon, do as the Babylonians. You hear all these arguments, right? Or they could have said, don't pray to the statue. Just notice that your sandals are loose. And just kneel and don't make a spectacle. Strap up your sandals when the music plays. 
I bet you there were a thousand different rationalizations that the devil was offering them, but they had a lot of backbone. And even though they knew they were going to lose their position, they were going to lose their retirement, they were going to lose their jobs, they were going to lose their lives, no matter what they were going to lose, they were not going to shame their God by disobeying him. They had been trying to witness there in the courts of Babylon to everybody about Jehovah. What would it mean now if they bowed down and compromised? What does it do to our witness when we compromise? You know how they were prepared to stand that day? You don't get ready for a storm. <laughs> I knew I should have packed my umbrella when I came to Lansing. <laughs> but I looked online and it wasn't raining that day. So I've got about 20 umbrellas at home on a shelf from all of my trips because I seem to wait until I get somewhere before I think about it. You don't want to wait until the storm comes to be prepared for the storm. Years ago, 1964, I was living with my father in Miami Beach. I don't know if anyone remembers Hurricane Betsy. It not only went through Miami, it came and it hit the Gulf Coast as well. And everybody was frantically lined up at the hardware stores getting plywood and everything, but my father, knowing that uh, that storm country, he had in his garage storm shutters, and he said, looks like we're going to have to put up the storm shutters. He didn't say, I'm going to go buy some. He had them. I'm telling you right now, friends, there's a storm coming that will test your faith. And if you want to pass that big test, you need to be faithful now in the little things. If we are bowing down now when we need to stand, what do you think you're going to do when that incredible pressure comes from everybody around you? Now we need to be faithful in the little things if we're going to have a faith that will stand during that time. Is this some weird denominational theology or is this just clean Bible teaching? We've got to learn what it means to obey God and do what he says. These are the heroes in the Bible. And so the music played. And they pulled the string that held the curtain up and the curtain dropped and the, probably the setting sun was shining off this golden image and it just was so glorious and everybody was worshiping and the music and it just made you, it was inspiring. And you probably even felt like worshiping, but they did not go with what they felt like doing. Nobody feels like going to a furnace. They stood when everyone else bowed down. And I expect they might have had people tugging on their trousers and they swatted them away and they said, here we stand. God said, do not and we will not. Well, finally, they, it was so obvious they disobeyed and some of their enemies probably observed that they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar and he gave them a very clear guideline. He said, look, I recognize you, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You're some of my top advisors. You're in the cabinet of wise men in my kingdom. You're brilliant. I respect you for your integrity. Perhaps you did not hear the command. I know it's a second language for you, but uh, I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to give you another chance because what the devil, the devil's really not big on just making martyrs out of the faithful. He'd much rather have them capitulate their faith. I'm going to play the music again, give you another chance. And boy, if you don't bow down, see that furnace over there? They're tossing the wood in right now. It's seven times hotter than we need it to melt gold down. And you know, they said, King, you don't need to play the music again. Probably was the wrong kind of music anyway. There's Babylonian music, which we have in a lot of churches today. Not only our churches. He's, you don't need to play it again. Our God that we serve is able to deliver us. Don't forget that. Our God is able. You know what that means? They believed. Notice this. Were they saved by works or by faith? They were saved by faith. They said, we believe he's able. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Don't separate their faith was demonstrated in obedience. We like to separate the two, and as soon as someone starts talking about obeying the commandments, we call them legalistic. I got a question for you. Is obedience legalism? I'll tell you, everywhere I go, I say pretty much the same thing, and I get a lot of narrow looks even from within our church because folks are being brainwashed 
by Babylonian theology to think if you talk about the commandments of God and obeying the commandments of God, you're a legalist. Well, if I put away all of the background noise and I read my Bible, I don't know how you can arrive at any other conclusion but that God wants us to obey His law. And you know what? Whenever you're in doubt, do the safe thing. They said, even if He doesn't deliver us, He said, don't bow down, we're not bowing down, and if we get in trouble, it's His fault. We're doing what He said. God wants more people to stand up for His Word. So the king said, enough of you. Strongest men in the kingdom threw them in the fiery furnace, tied them up with their clothes just as they were. And if you wonder if the fire was hot, the fire was so hot that it incinerated the soldiers that threw them in. God always sort of reinforces His miracles. Uh, they were not some Fijian fire walkers that just managed to walk across some hot coals as a trick. It was an inferno they were thrown into. And of course, you know the story. The king looked at a distance and he expected to see them just vaporize. Instead, he saw them get up. The ropes were burnt. They're walking around, except he saw there were four in there and one had the appearance like the Son of God. You may go through fiery trials for your faith, but the good news is when you pass through the fire, he says, I'll be with you. When you go through the waters, I will be with you. He doesn't say there'll be no trials in being a Christian, but it's still a lot easier to take up the yoke of Jesus. And now what he said, my yoke is easy. It's a lot heavier to bow down to Babylon. Now, it didn't just happen there if you've got doubts about it. These great stories in the Bible, Daniel chapter 6, a little different slant, but a similar story. King of Medo-Persia, <clears throat> he gets roped into making a law and the law says that if you're caught praying to anybody but the king for 30 days, you're going to the lion's den, which is another kind of fiery furnace. It was a death penalty, not a very pleasant one. And you notice he said, we're not asking you to go against your conscience forever, just for 30 days. There's a, there's a time measurement on it here. You don't have to do it forever, but just during this emergency, we've got martial law. Everybody needs to work together. You listening? And so he makes this national law. You know, he knew the same thing Nebuchadnezzar knew. If you can't get your people together through common uh, government or, or customs or language, you can unite them in one world religion through common worship. There's not going to be one world government in the last days. The Bible says he makes all the world worship. Daniel 2 says they'll not cleave one to another. Politically, they're never going to get it together. Culturally, there's always going to be differences. The languages, they'll always be unique languages and customs. But they're going to try and unite the world through common religion. And so they make the law. And maybe King Darius didn't realize what he was getting into. And here's what it says, Daniel chapter 6, verse 7. Very clear, establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, he'll be cast into the den of lions. Death decree. Now, Daniel prayed three times a day. If you read in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says he had a custom. Why did Daniel have that custom? Because Daniel read the Bible. And Daniel read in Psalm 55 where King David said, morning, evening, and at noon will I pray. So Daniel prayed three times a day. Everyone knew he prayed three times a day. Matter of fact, his enemies had the king sign the law because they wanted to get rid of Daniel. His goodness made their badness stand out. Just like the enemies of Christ wanted to get rid of Jesus because his goodness made their badness stand out. They even had spies following Daniel around. They said, we're not going to find anything against this Daniel unless we find it against it concerning the law of his God. What's going to be the big issue in the last days? The law of God. What's happening to the Christian church today? Getting real sloppy about the law of God. We're not under the law. We're under grace. We don't need to obey. Just in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, it, it, it doesn't have to be actual. I mean, that's legalism. It's the spirit. It's not the letter. Have you heard these things before? Daniel was very clear. First commandment says you are not to worship other gods, and that would include other 
monarchs. And Daniel uh, probably could have thought, you know, this would be a good time to take the words of Jesus that says, uh, enter into your closet and shut the door. But no, no, that's not the time to do that. Then it would look like he was ashamed of his God, even though it was going to cost him his life. He opened his windows toward Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Because Daniel read in the Bible. Daniel read the Bible. You read in Daniel chapter 9, it says, Why I was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. Daniel read in the Bible when Solomon said, if you're carried away captive to another land because of the unfaithfulness of the people, if you pray towards this place. So he was praying towards Jerusalem. He not only read what it said, he did what it said. Amen? So he prayed towards Jerusalem. Three times that day. And he was eventually brought before the king and the king did not want to lose Daniel. You know, there's a lot of parallels between Daniel and Jesus in this story. They had spies following Jesus around. The Bible says that the king labored till the going down of the sun to deliver Daniel. He, when he found out, he didn't want to lose Daniel. He was the only honest man in his government. Honest politicians, hard to find. Amen? <laughs> labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. What time of day did Jesus die? Finally, when he realized there was no other way, Father said, if there be any other way. There was no other way. They brought him and they threw him in the lion's den. And they put a stone over the mouth. Was a stone placed over the mouth of Christ's tomb? And they sealed it with a government seal. Was there a seal placed on the tomb of Christ? Did Jesus come out alive? Did Daniel come out alive? And I like what the king says when he looks into the den the next morning, what time of day did Jesus rise? Early in the morning. And he moved away the stone. And he said, has your God, who you serve continually, been able to deliver you? And he says, my God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Now, maybe you're thinking the lions weren't really hungry, so it's no miracle. The fire wasn't hot. The lions weren't hungry. This is what all the skeptics say. If you don't think the lions were hungry, keep reading. It says the lions were so hungry that all of those who had accused Daniel were thrown in. And the King James says the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces or ever they came to the bottom of the den. These were furious, hungry, ravenous Asian lions. It was a miracle. You know why? God sent his angel. Jesus was with Daniel in the lion's den. Jesus was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And if you stand up for the Lord and you obey the Lord, Jesus will be with you. See, you've got to make up your mind. Everybody just really has two choices. You're all in trouble. You just get to decide who you're in trouble with. <laughs> you're either in trouble with the world and you follow the Lord, but you get everlasting life, or you're in trouble with the Lord and you follow the world and you enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and you're lost forever. Those are your choices. God has always had a law. It's not something that was thought up at Mount Sinai. You can read in the Bible where God said, speaking of his servant Abraham, Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments. Wait, there were commandments way back then with Abraham? My commandments, my statutes, and my laws. God's law is not a Jewish thing. It goes all the way back even before. Joseph. He refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. He said, how can I commit this sin? Adultery was a sin. Matter of fact, you can go back to the two sons of Adam and Eve. God said to Cain, sin is at your door. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of God's law. It is a big deal. And yet people accuse Seventh-day Adventists of being legalistic because we talk about the Sabbath. That'll be part of our subject tomorrow night. What was the purpose of the Messiah? I thought Jesus came to do away with the law. Is that what the Bible says? No, it's quite the opposite. You see, Jesus came to magnify the law and make it honorable. The devil hates the law of God. Jesus came to exalt the law of God. As a matter of fact, without the law, you don't have sin. What is sin? James chapter 4, verse 17. Well, there's four definitions for sin you're going to find in your New Testament. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Romans 14, verse 23, 
whatever is not of faith is sin. If a person knows that something's wrong and, and in their heart they know they shouldn't be doing it, then, well, they shouldn't be doing it. The conscience will also guide them in that. All unrighteousness is sin, and the best definition is whoever commits sin transgresses the law, 1 John 3, verse 4, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, is there still sin in the world today? Then God must still have his law. Where there's no law, there's no sin. Let me see if I can explain in simple terms why this is such an important issue. Sin is the transgression of God's law. The beginning would be the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, of course, are summarized in the two great commandments. First of all, let's start up at the top. God is what? God is love. All right. Then the Ten Commandments are divided on two tables, and God used two tables for a reason. It wasn't because he ran out of room on the first table and said, I better cut another one. There's a distinction made. The first four commandments deal with man's relationship with God, his obligations to God. The last six commandments deal with the horizontal relationship, man's relationship with his fellow man. It's this relationship and it's this relationship. In the law is the cross. You got that? I've got two arms, ten fingers. I demonstrate my action with these two things. You got Six commandments that deal with love for your fellow man. First four deal with love for God. It's all about love. Yes, two great commandments, but those two great commandments do not trump the ten. The two great commandments are the motivation for the ten. That just is telling you that it's supposed to spring from the heart, but they're basics. They don't go away. And yet, I hear people say everywhere I go, well, because of Jesus now and because of grace and because of faith, we're free from the law. Is that how God operates? Now that we have uh, faith in, in Christ, has the law been done away with? Romans 6, verse 14 and 15. Have you heard it said before, we're not under the law, we're under grace now. Listen to what Paul says. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. What then? Shall we continue to sin because we're not under the law? Shall we continue to break the Ten Commandments because we're not under the penalty of the law? God forbid. He says, God forbid. And yet some people say, well, we're under grace now, as though it means that when we're under grace, we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is the very, it's the elementary part. And yet, let me just see your hands. No, I don't mean right now, but after my question. How many of you have heard Christians say, now that we're under the new covenant, we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments any more? Do you know that really is a doctrine of devils when you think about it? Because there's really only two choices. Either God wants us to keep the Ten Commandments or he doesn't want us to. God is not indifferent. He's not saying, well, you know, if you want to murder, that's up to you. Just, you know, however you feel. People really don't have a problem with the Ten Commandments until they get to one in particular. And you could stand up and, well, I'm getting into tomorrow night's subject. I won't do that right now. Did Jesus come to do away with the law or did he come to magnify the law? You read in that prophecy in Isaiah 42, verse 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law. What does magnify mean? Make bigger or smaller? He'll magnify the law and he'll make it honorable. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fill it full. And again, in Romans, I'm sorry, in Matthew um, chapter 5, verse 27, you have heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now think about this for just a second, if you will. Some people say that's the letter of the law. New Testament Christians now we go by the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is what Jesus is saying. The spirit of the law says you shouldn't think about it. It's not only an action, it's an attitude. And that's true. But here's the big question. Once you're keeping the spirit of the law, 
will you be breaking the letter? I do believe we should go by the spirit of the law. But you show me somebody who's keeping the spirit of the law and breaking the letter of the law, and I'll show you a liar. The Bible says if anyone says that uh, they love him and they keep not his commandments, I'm just quoting the Bible. They're a liar and the truth is not in him. So if a person is saying, I believe in the spirit of the law, I'm not going to think adulterous thoughts, but I'm going to commit adultery, but not in my mind. I'm going to keep the spirit of the law. Spirit of the law says, well, the letter of the law, let me start there. The letter of the law says, you're not to bear false witness, to be honest. The spirit of the law says, don't even swear. Don't make these vows. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So if a person is keeping the spirit of the law, will they be keeping the letter of the law? Of course they will. The letter of the law says you shall not commit murder. Jesus said the spirit of the law says if I'm angry with my brother or my sister without cause, I'm guilty of murder in my heart. So very rarely do people commit murder without at least first thinking about it in the attitudes and the heart, right? So if a person is keeping the spirit of the law, can you imagine how ludicrous it would be if someone stood before the judge and said, you know, in my heart, I was keeping the spirit of the law. I realize I murdered them intentionally, but, you know, in my heart, how can you do that? And so many Christians have fallen for these doctrines of devils is what they are. You just got to call it what it is. And they've infiltrated the Christian church. And what really worries me is they're finding their way into the remnant church. And if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? If we're losing our footing, then where's anyone going to go? You know, there is a trend that you can see in revival movements. The Lutheran church was born from a revival movement. Martin Luther said, the Bible and the Bible only. It was getting back to the truth. And it was a tremendous titanic struggle to tear themselves away from the traditions and the false teachings of the mother church. But after you tra trace the uh, Lutheran church three or four generations, it seems like three or four generations is sort of when it happens they sort of lose the vision of the founders that laid their lives on the line, that stood. Martin Luther said, here I stand, God help me. He stood against just this, this monolith institution because it wasn't biblical. But you go three or four generations and they started to abandon those positions. Until today, there's, <laughs> the hands have been stretched across the abyss. And there's been a great treaty between the Catholics and the Lutherans, and they're all hugging each other. And in the 95 Theses, they sort of reenacted it in reverse. Martin Luther would have turned over in his grave. John Wesley, Methodist movement, started as, they were called legalists because they were so methodical about the religion, about times of prayer and times of study and good deeds and kind of evaluating your life. Let every man examine himself. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 13, it says that. Is that legalism? Say, am I living the life? Am I following Jesus? Is he being reflected in me? That's not wrong. That's not legalism. And so they were called Methodists and accused of legalism. It was a godly movement swept across England and Europe and North America, great revival. People turning away from sin. Bars were closing wherever Wesley and Whitfield preached. You look at the fruit and you can tell it was from God. There was a change in the life. People were putting away their sins. God was blessing. And you go three or four generations, and with all due respect to my Methodist friends, I used to teach Sunday school in a Methodist church. Very few read their Bibles on a regular basis, know what it even says anymore, that can defend the teachings. All kinds of things are coming in that to, in order to grow the church using worldly methods to try and grow the church and abandoning the methods of Christ. Do you think we're immune from that uh, pattern? We're right now about the fourth generation. And you're seeing a trend. People are losing their footing. They don't even know what they believe. I meet people all the time. And uh, they find out I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. They say, oh, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And I can look at them right now. And I can say, oh, yeah? They just, they just don't have that spirit about them. And I'll say, when were you in church last? Well, I'm not practicing. Is there such a thing? <laughs> Is it genetic? I didn't know it was genetic. I thought it was a lifestyle. 
I thought it was following Christ, following his word. Where the foundations are under attack, friends. It tells us in Psalms 111, verse 7 and 8, all of his, how long does the, does the law of God last? All of his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever, and how long? Forever and ever. You know what it boils down to? Is God wanting us to be hearers of the word or doers of the word? Romans chapter 2, 13. Some people like to use Paul. It's amazing to me that they're not satisfied with what Jesus says about the law, so they try to get Paul to undo what Jesus says. And by the way, I always thought it was also interesting, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, one of the only times in the Bible that one apostle talks about the teachings of another apostle, and he says, be careful. Peter, talking about the writings of Paul, says, be careful, because people use the things that Paul says. Some of them are difficult to understand. They twist them as they do other scriptures to their own destruction, and they go after the way of the heir of the lawless. What was the issue? Lawless. And people are always trying to twist what Paul says to say, well, we don't need to keep the law. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just in the sight of God, but the what? The doers of the law. Jesus said, it's not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, that will be in the kingdom, but those that what? Do the will of my Father in heaven. God is looking for people who are doers, who like Isaiah will say, here am I, send me. I'm willing to go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. Mark 3, verse 32 through 35. There was a multitude around Jesus one day, and they came to Christ, and they said, uh, your brothers are seeking you. But he answered, and he said to them, who is my mother or my brothers? Who are my people? Listen to what Jesus said. And he looked about those who were there. Here are my mother and my brothers, whoever does the will of God. This is my brother and my sister and my mother. So those who say I'm part of Christ's family and they're not doing the will of God, they're saying, Lord, Lord. And what does Jesus say about the multitude, the many who will in the last day say, Lord, Lord, he'll say, I don't know you. I just am pleading with your souls, friends, that you will not be in that group. You don't have to be. But the Bible tells us it's the majority who they love to beat the tambourine and say, Lord, Lord, but they're not doing his will. Now I've got to be careful that you understand that it's not something we do by our own power. It's by his grace that we do it. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. How many self-deceived people are out there? They're, they're losing their, their footing. If we're going to go by what the Bible says, then it's very clear God's law is still intact and he wants us to follow it. And if we are breaking his law, we're going against his will. Because Psalm 40, verse 8 says, Yea, I love to do thy will. Thy law is within my heart. The very simplest expression of the will of God is the law of God. So all these people are saying, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what the will of God is, and I'm praying about the will of God. Well, you could start with the Bible, and you could start with Exodus 20. You could go to Matthew 5. Look at the Sermon on the Mount about loving your, your enemies. And that would include loving your neighbor. It's interesting, the Bible commands us to love our neighbors and love our enemies, and that's often because our neighbors become our biggest enemies, right? <laughs> and neighbor means nigh brother. A lot of disputes and fighting even in the church, people who take the name of Christ and they can't get along with each other. Starts with the basics. This is the will of God, to be doers of his word. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. Start with verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust thereof. Catch this part. But he that does the will of God will live forever. So is God looking for people who are just going to say, Lord, Lord, or people who are willing to do his will? Well, how can we do his will? Can we do anything without Christ, friends? Nope. 
I hope you'll forgive me for fumbling with my papers. I had so much to say that uh, I knew I wasn't going to get it all, all, in, all in. I don't want to just leave you with the idea that I'm just telling you start obeying God's commandments because it doesn't work as easy as that. The law is there to show us what uh, sin is and help us recognize our need of Jesus. You catch that? The devil hates the law of God because without the law, there is no sin. It's through the law we have a knowledge of sin. If we're not aware of our sin, then do we need a Savior? And through the devil downplaying the law of God, he's downplaying the problem we've got. We've got a dilemma. We're holding with the cords of our sins, and we need deliverance. And as soon as we realize what the problem is, we know what the sickness is, we find out where the doctor is, and Jesus is the solution. And we go to him for cleansing. How can we obey God? If you uh, look in your Bibles, in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he came and resisted temptation using the same power that is available to you and me. God's Spirit, the power of the Father, it'll come into your life. How many of you experience victory over sin? I mean, I'm not saying all sin. I'm talking about, has God delivered you from anything? I mean, if I know if the Lord could save me from stealing and drinking and drugs and cursing and all those things, that the other things I struggle with, he that began a good work in me will perform it. He can deliver you. So when we say, well, we really can't be overcomers, what you're implying is that your devil is bigger than your God. You believe in the devil's power to tempt you to sin. Don't you believe in Jesus' power to deliver you from sin? If Christ, coming in the form of sinful flesh, could live a perfect life, he's shown us that by his coming into our heights, he can live out that life through us. But he's got to be on the inside. Let me finish reading this for you. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. 